come to, on behalf of the McCain Institute for International Leadership at Arizona State University, to tonight's debate, Russia, Time to Contain. Since 2013, the McCain Institute's debate and decision series have served as convener of frank and informed dialogue that strives to build deeper understanding, mutual respect, political civility, and decisive action. Debate topics have ranged from China to transatlantic trade to drone warfare. Tonight, we are especially pleased to welcome back David Kramer. David previously served as the Institute's Senior Director of, for Human Rights and Democracy and is now an affiliated senior fellow at the, of the Institute. A special congratulation to him on his new book, which you should have gotten on the, on the way into the auditorium, Back to Containment, Dealing with Putin's Regime. Please note that this event will be live streamed. For those of you that are on social media, please join the conversation using the hashtag MIDebate and by following it at McCain Institute. I am uh, Michael Polt. I am the Senior Director at the Institute. On I'm here on behalf of our Executive Director, Kurt Volker, who could not be with us tonight. But the most important person for tonight's debate I'm just about to introduce, and that's Elise Labatt. Um, she's tonight's moderator. She will conduct this entire debate. She's a correspondent uh, for Global Affairs at CNN, and you have seen her many, many times on, this, on your screens. She covers U.S. foreign policy and international affairs. She has reported from more than 75 countries and traveled the world with five secretaries of state. We are very, very lucky to have her here, and I'd like you to welcome Elise Lavitt. Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you to the McCain Institute and to everyone here tonight. It looks, couldn't have a more timely discussion, a more timely debate um, about Russia, and um, a better panel to uh, debate these important issues. As uh, the Ambassador said, we're going to be live streaming this, and we encourage everybody to uh, take to Twitter. The hashtag is M hashtag MI debate. Um, if you hear something interesting or you have a comment or something, uh, feel free to um, jump on Twitter. Um, I'm going to talk about the debate format for tonight. It's going to uh, begin with an opening argument from each team. Each team is going to get four minutes to present their opening argument or two minutes per panelist. And I think we have three minutes up there, but we need to um, have four minutes. Following the opening arguments, I'm going to pose several questions to the debaters. Each team will get two minutes uh, to answer the moderator's questions, and the opposing team will be allowed one minute of follow-up. And after I ask a few questions, we're going to take questions from you and the audience. These questions can be directed at specific panelists or teams from both sides. And then at the end, um, we're going to have some policy recommendations from each panelist, and each panelist will have uh, one minute to summarize the suggestions. Mm -hmm. um, now, obviously, the, the topic tonight is how to contain Russia. But to say the relationship with Russia and the U.S. is complicated would be doing it a great disservice. There are no countries I can think of in the world today in which the U.S. is working together on so many issues, yet has diverging interests and acute tensions, but where the stakes uh, are greater. And the U.S. and Russia are cooperating on terrorism, Iran, North Korea, and they're trying to find common ground on the fight against ISIS. They're working on a new START treaty on nuclear reduction. Yet Russia's actions in support of Bashar al-Assad in Syria, its actions in Crimea, eastern Ukraine, and its increasingly concerning behavior elsewhere in its backyard have caused the U.S. and its NATO allies to redouble their efforts to thwart Russian expansionism. And then there is the meddling of uh, what the intelligence community calls Russian meddling in the U.S. election and the numerous investigations that that activity has prompted, including into members of the Trump campaign that have cast a shadow over President Trump's hopes of improving ties with Russia. So that brings us to the question that we're posed with today. Is it time to contain Russia? And if so, what does that look like? Or can we focus on areas where U.S. and Russian interests converge in the hopes of strengthening cooperation? Are problems with Vladimir Putin himself 
or is Russia a strategic foe that transcends the ambition of one man? And as I said, we couldn't have a more stellar panel to debate these issues tonight, arguing that the U.S. should contain Russia. We have David Kramer. Uh, we have Evelyn Farkas. And arguing that the United States should engage with Russia, Tom Graham and Matthew Rajansky. So I'm going to start the clock. Do we have four minutes on the clock? And if someone is... Three minutes. I have four minutes here, but... Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So we're going to start with arguing that the U.S. should contain Russia. And we have David and Evelyn. Uh, thanks very much, Elise. Before I eat into my time, if I could, let me just thank... Stop the, the clock. Stop the clock. <laughs> uh, I just want to thank the McCain Institute for inviting me back and thank them also for giving me the opportunity to uh, produce this book. And, and thanks to my colleagues here uh, on both sides of the aisle in this debate. Um, all right, start the clock. Uh, obviously, with the title of my book, I, along with Evelyn, firmly believe it is time to contain the Putin regime. In fact, it's past time, and in part because we have to recognize the clear and, and existential threat that the Putin regime poses to us, to its neighbors, and perhaps just as importantly to its own people. Putin's authoritarian, kleptocratic regime shares no values with us and increasingly shares fewer and fewer interests. Instead, Putin and his circle portray the West, NATO, the EU, certainly the United States, as threats to Russia and to his grip on power. And he, he needs to perpetuate the myth that we are trying to undermine his regime. He's invaded Georgia, he's invaded Ukraine, because he refuses to recognize these countries' rights to determine their own future. He doesn't recognize the principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity, and he's trying to redraw the map in Europe. He uses energy and propaganda to pressure and undermine his neighbors. He launched a cyber attack against Estonia and tried to muddle in the Ukrainian 2014 election. A Russian leader truly looking to advance his country's national interests would want prosperous, stable neighbors along his borders, not Putin. He fears a successful Georgia or a successful Ukraine as threatening alternatives to the system he has established. He's banned adoptions of his own citizens by American citizens, eliminated gubernatorial elections. How is that in Russia's national interest? He doesn't abide by international agreements, whether it's the Sarkozy plan for Georgia, the two men ceasefire agreements on Ukraine, the Budapest Memorandum of 94, the Friendship Treaty with Ukraine in 97, the principles of sovereignty, territorial integrity. He illegally annexed Crimea, sparking the most, security, the most uh, serious security crisis in Europe in nearly seven decades. And he bears responsibility, ultimately, for the shootdown of MH17 that killed nearly 300 people. He broke from the CFE Treaty, he's in violation of the IMF Treaty, and most recently there are disputes about the Open Sky Treaty. The list goes on and on. We don't share interests in Syria. He wants to prop up Assad. Uh, we are trying to deal with ISIS and support moderate forces. He's undermining the sanctions in North Korea and Afghanistan. He and his regime have been providing support to the Taliban. On Iran, yes, they were involved in the nuclear accord. But Russia is aligning itself with Iran, particularly in support of Assad, and provides it with advanced, sophisticated weapons. Putin and Russian officials have threatened the use of nuclear weapons against countries that would host missile defense sites. And they've threatened uh, NATO aircraft and military planes through reckless buzzing and, and overflights. Then, of course, is the unprecedented interference in our election last year, in which he was trying not only to influence our electoral process, but to discredit the whole notion of our democratic system of government. The abusive treatment of American diplomats serving in Russia is also not something to be overlooked. Finally, after returning formally to the presidency in 2012, Putin launched the worst crackdown on human rights inside Russia since the breakup of the USSR and created an ugly environment in which government critics, journalists, activists are harassed, intimidated, uh, beaten, poisoned, and even killed. He's created a massive kleptocracy whose best export to the West is corruption. Putin, in other words, is a wholly untrustworthy interlocutor. And every administration has tried to uh, engage with uh, the Putin regime, and every administration has come away severely disappointed. Let me turn it over to Evelyn to talk about what uh, we should do about this. I'm going to turn it over to Evelyn, but you have a minute and 15 seconds. Okay. No worries. A minute and 15 seconds. 
We need a firm approach to Russia. We need a modern 21st century containment strategy in response to all of the items that David just mentioned. Just as the Cold War strategy was to contain communism and deter the Soviet Union, we need to counter Putin and Putinism, which is essentially authoritarian kleptocracy, and to deter Russia's violations of international law. Our democracy and liberal free market capitalism are vital to America, and Russia seeks to weaken, if not destroy, both. Okay, what do we need to do? I'll, I'll say it very quickly, and then I can elaborate later. But first of all, modern containment should include military deterrence. That means strengthening NATO and non-NATO partners and allies to resist and repel Russian invasion. Two, economic sanctions to ensure Russian elites are punished, and the Russian defense industry cannot benefit from U.S., European, or Japanese technologies <laughs> or know-how. Three, robust democracy to highlight Russian trans transgressions and to rally the international community to impose diplomatic and political costs. Russia must be held accountable not only for the invasions, occupations, election <laughs> interference, and information wars, but also for all of the items David mentioned, the Budapest Memorandum violation imp and impact on nonproliferation, the shootdown of MH17, targeted global assassinations and violations of the bilateral nuclear and multinational conventional arms control agreements. We must be firm in our communications with the Kremlin regarding past behavior and what we expect now and in the future. My last sentence. Until Russia comes back into compliance with international law and stops challenging the international order, we have no choice but to contain the Kremlin. Okay, thank you, um, Evelyn and David. <laughs> Very tight, cogent argument about Russian behavior, why it's time to contain and what the U.S. Um, can and should do. Now I'm going to hand it over to um, um, Tom and Matt. Are we going to? Uh, we're going to go back to. We're going to go back to four to minutes it. on the clock. <laughs> <laughs> we have four minutes. It's up to you how you want to. It's up to you how you okay. want to use Thank it. Thank you very much. Oh no! By now I've we, done a few of these. I'm four. very strict on the clock. Can we go back to four minutes? We're on four minutes. There you go. Okay. Good. Two, three, Thank go. You. Thank you. This is the third time in the past two years that David and I have debated the general topic of containing Russia. Now, I'm not going to assess the previous two debates. Let me just note that since the onset of the Ukraine crisis in 2014, U.S. policy has sought to contain Russia in an effort to change Russia's behavior in ways that are favorable to the United States. What has been the result? <laughs> Russia is consolidating its control over Crimea. It continues to provide vital support to separatists in eastern Ukraine. It has turned the military tide in Assad's favor in Syria, and it continues to interfere in the electoral processes in Europe and the United States. David and Evelyn's position is that the United States needs to pursue containment with greater zeal until Russia ultimately cracks as the Soviet Union did during the Cold War. Now, this doesn't conform to the definition of an insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. But it does ignore history and conditions of today's world. It's not that the United States hasn't tried containment before. <laughs> we refused to recognize the Soviet Union after the Bolshevik Revolution and only did so in 1933 in an effort to isolate uh, uh, that country no longer made sense amidst the growing turmoil in Europe. We refused to recognize communist China after Mao's victory, and we maintained that position until the 1970s when President Nixon saw the strategic advantage of aligning with China against the Soviet Union. And then there's Cuba. We maintained an embargo for over 50 years, uh, and we still haven't overthrown the regime. Now, even a close look at the supposed successful case of containment, the defeat of the Soviet Union in the Cold War, undermines the case for containment today. For the Soviet Union collapsed, not because of containment, but because it broke the bonds of containment to extend its reach into Latin America, Africa, and Asia, and ultimately fell victim to overstretch. Its resources could not keep up with its commitments, and Gorbachev's efforts to reform the country led to its demise. In short, containment has not worked in the past, and it will not work against Russia today. We cannot contain one of the world's largest economies in today's interconnected world, particularly if the emerging giants of, like China and India are not prepared to follow the U.S. lead. Punishment through sanctions will ultimately disappoint because they seek 
Russia's capitulation on matters such as Ukraine that Russia considers to be vital interests. Russians are prepared to endure much more pain than we have the patience to administer over the long run. What we propose instead is engagement leavened with rea realism. We recognize the challenge that Russia poses to, the, to American interests. It interprets the principles of world order differently. It interprets, uh, is, it, we find it on the opposite side of major geopolitical issues. It does not share our values. Engagement does not proceed with the hope of partnership. It proceeds from the recognition that working with Russia or managing our differences is essential to American security and prosperity <laughs> going forward. An effective nonproliferation regime will require Russian, Russian support. We cannot resolve the crisis in Ukraine or Syria or build a durable system of security in Europe without taking Russian power and interest into account, and so on and so forth. The final thing is that we will have greater success if we deal with our multiple domestic problems. It's the promise of America uh, that is our greatest global asset. It's that promise that had an impact on Russian citizens uh, and ended the, helped end the Cold War. The problem is that we don't look like a success today and certainly not to the overwhelming majority of Russians. So dealing with our problems at home, acting as a way to attract Russians will have much greater impact at influencing Russia than trying to punish or contain it. Thank you. Uh, that is uh, team two. Um, engagement, uh, not based on values, but based on realism. Um, I'm going to, if you could put a minute on the clock, I'm going to give each. Two minutes, right? Two minutes for rebuttal. Two minutes, <laughs> two minutes for rebuttal, sorry. Uh, if you want to do it a minute and a minute, that's fine. But we have two minutes, two minutes for rebuttal, and David or Evelyn take the floor. Sure. Let me start. Um, and Tom, I think by the tenth debate you and I do, we'll be on the same side. Um, I'm not sure. Well, I know which side I'll be on. Anyway, uh, I, I, let me pick up on where uh, I think we agree, which is for us to stand up for our values and principles to get our own house in order. Putin's greatest export is corruption. To export it, we import it. We need to clean up our own act and make sure that he is not able to exploit our openness and our willingness to uh, be bought. We have to stand for our values and our principles together with our allies. And as long as we're standing with our, with, for our values and principles, I don't see how we can stand in the, in the same room with Putin. It's not to say we should never talk to Russia. Of course we have to talk to them to try to deconflict problems in Syria and elsewhere. But you look at the list of issues that Evelyn and I talked about, we don't have anything. People used to say North Korea might be something we could talk to them about. They undermine our sanctions. They water them down in the Security Council. They're providing energy to North Korea. Even on North Korea, which may be the biggest challenge we face right now, Russia is not our ally. It's not our partner. It is, in fact, trying to undermine and hurt what we're trying to do in North Korea. China is a different issue, and we can talk about that separately. But we have to avoid over-personalizing relations with Russia uh, with the Putin regime, rather, and make sure that we don't come across as wanting this relationship more than they do. And if I can add one thing, I think that we demonstrated under the George W. Bush administration and the Obama administration that engagement isn't realistic. It's not employing realism because we had too many hopes that we could cooperate with the Kremlin, with this Russian government, and frankly speaking, the engagement didn't bring us cooperation. It didn't bring us the results, you know, that you, I mean, it brought us the results that you actually laid out for us. So I don't see any hope beyond standing firm and containing Russia. Okay, we're going to take two minutes on the clock, but I just have a quick question. I don't think that Tom said that Putin is an ally or Putin is a partner. I think he just said that working with Russia is necessary um, because of the wide range of um, global issues that both countries are, you know, facing in the international community. Can, yeah. I mean, just, just the question quickly, I would I ask, mean, and I know you guys get your... Mixing it up a little bit. I don't think it's necessarily <laughs> they, they, necessary. Right. It depends. In the question, and I know you guys get to go in response, but... Uh, <laughs> is, at, at some in, point. Engagement for what purpose? Right. Engagement itself is not a strategy. Um, the strategy should be figuring out ways to affect better behavior coming out of Moscow. 
And in, in the book, I argue that actually we should aspire for or, or should want to see a change in regime, but that shouldn't be part of our strategy because we're not in a position to bring that about, to bring it to fruition. Instead, right. it, we have to do whatever we can to try to change Russian behavior. And frankly, I think the problem, Tom, has not been a lack of uh, or, or too much containment. It's been a lack of containment. Um, Matt, are you so going to? Before you. Two minutes, two minutes on the I, I'd love to have my two minutes. And also, You'll before get. you start the two minutes, at least, can I just say thank you? It's <laughs> my first time on this stage. It's fantastic. I realize maybe Evelyn and I are sort of like uh, guest stars on the David and, yeah, yeah. and Tom I meant show. I so say that's... thank you, too. <laughs> I just, I don't want to eat up my time on this. Thank, thank you. you. Wonderful. Okay, now we can do the two minutes. Yes? Yep, yep. two okay. minutes on the clock. Great. Uh, so I, I want to say, first of all, I think a lot of what has already been said, not only by Tom, but also by Evelyn and David, reflects an accurate assessment of the factual record. I am one who believes that facts matter, history matters, uh, and I think we have uh, far more that we agree about here uh, than we disagree about. Um, I think that the two basic disagreements that are baked into what we've heard are, uh, first, why Russia matters to the United States. And I think, interestingly, David, uh, at the end of his rebuttal or, or, or response remarks here, started to talk about what, what Russia does, but both in the book, which I've actually read and, and I thought was in many respects great and agreed with. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, believe it or not. Uh, uh, and in the comments tonight, yeah, yeah, I got a signed copy, thank you. Uh, and in the comments tonight, there's a tremendous amount about what Russia is, the nature of Russia, the evil of the Putin regime, the nature of this system, and that that, in fact, is what should concern us most about Russia. In fact, the threats that we face from what Russia has done, uh, or the ways in which Russia obstructs our ability to advance our interests, or the ways in which Russia could facilitate but chooses not to, solutions that we care about, these are the things that matter most. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is if we are focused on the regime, the nature of the regime, containing and combating the regime, are we provoking a response from Russia that is fundamentally a defensive crouch that says we're going to do absolutely everything and anything that we can to undermine you and your rules and the promises that we have made you and your interests? Because we understand at the end of the day what you're after, whether you admit it or not, is regime change because you think that the nature of us and our system is something that you cannot abide. And that's to the second point, and I'll do this quickly. Um, that is, I think that there's a different understanding here about how politics in Russia works. In the book, for instance, David talks about the need to stand up for civil society in Russia, for free media, for those Russians who have suffered uh, under the jackboot of the state, and all of these things are very right in a moral sense. But in a practical sense, in the morality of outcomes, if the United States engages in these questions in the interests of the Russian people, in the abstraction of what would be good for Russia, then at the end of the day, we tell the Russians that we will choose outcomes for you, you will not choose them for yourselves. And I think that's likely to provoke the same response that we talked about of us versus them, which is not going to facilitate our interests. Um, just a quick question. Um, you both talk about, you know, facts matter, history matters. Do American values matter? Because they don't necessarily matter. Values and principles are only values and principles when they're inconvenient, not when they're convenient. I mean, there's a lot of countries where it's low-hanging fruit, and it's easy to say we're going to stand up for our values, but Russia would be a case where um, I think it's not so convenient. I think, if, if I can, I think uh, it's, it's an important question. Of course values matter. Values almost never matter in the abstract. Where they matter is when they are being lived or when they are being explicitly denied or betrayed. And I think that the challenge the United States has is that all throughout the Cold War, the reality was that our most powerful instrument, our most powerful weapon against the Soviet Union's ideology, against the evil empire, if you wanted to call it that, was the reality that we lived our values. To the extent that we don't do that today or that Russians don't perceive us to do that, and they've got a fair amount of pretty accurate information about us, along with the dose of propaganda that they get. That is where we're weaker. That is where we don't have the arsenal of democracy that we should. Okay, we're going to, um, I'm going to ask some questions now. If we could put two minutes on the clock, I'm going to adjust the questions to one side, and then the other side will have um, a minute to respond, and I'm going to mix up, mix up the questions with both sides. So let me start with, um, with Matt and Tom, because I know what, um, I think I know what David and Evelyn might say. Um, in July at the Aspen Security Forum, um, General Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said that Russia, not North Korea, is becoming the greatest threat to the U.S. Um, and will over time. 
Defense Secretary Mattis also called Russia the, quote, principal threat. So is Russia a threat to the United States? What kind of threat? And if so, is it the greatest threat? Two minutes. Great question. Uh, clearly, Russia poses a challenge to the United States today. <laughs> Uh, and it poses a challenge along all the issues that we've been discussing over the past, over the past several minutes. Uh, but I think if you need to put this in a broader context, uh, and we need to think long term about, uh, about these things. Uh, China clearly is a long term challenge to the United States well, as well, and clearly a country that has the capability of becoming a peer competitor uh, over, the, over the next several years. And, is on the opposite side of many geopolitical issues, has, interprets the, the principles of world order in a different way, and doesn't share our values. Uh, I think that's a long-term strategic challenge. I think the challenge that Russia uh, presents right now uh, is a somewhat narrow one. Uh, it's not a country uh, that has a, uh, a bright future the way China does. Uh, I think it's a, a country that has significant uh, long-term problems. Uh, and what we need to do is fashion a policy now uh, that uh, advances our interest, uh, does not lead Russia uh, to do more in terms of creating mischief for us that is capable of doing at this point. Uh, and over the longer term, uh, in a sense, uh, it's not containing Russia, uh, but uh, dealing with a, a Russia that is in a much weaker position uh, than it is today. Can I just add, look, as a matter of objective fact, Russia is the only country uh, on Earth that in under an hour can end life as we know it in the United States. That in and of itself, the existence of that is a threat much the way a tank in your neighborhood would be a threat, right? And by the way, those exist too on, on the European front. So we have to conceive of Russia in potentially threatening terms, but potential is key here. And the way that we conduct this relationship, the way that the Russians expect us to behave, look at their military exercises. Evelyn, you brought this up. You know, this to me is the quintessential essential case of, n of not reading Russia closely. All of these military exercises are premised on what they expect to be an attack on either their territory or their interests in their immediate periphery. Okay, right? and we're going to get to that very issue, so I'm going to stop you there and um, pass it over. Uh, you guys have a minute. I'll, I'll start this time. <laughs> yeah, no, please. So, I, I mean, I don't buy the argument that just because Russia is a declining power, especially <clears throat> relative to China, that it's less dangerous. In fact, the only country that is currently threatening the United States, threatening our democracy and our way of life, is Russia. And whether we like it or not, the Russian government has decided they're in an adversarial relationship with us. So China, other countries, they may be challenges, but they are not adversaries. Right now, Russia is our adversary. These aren't narrow challenges. We're not talking about potential. Russia is responsible for killing Ukrainians almost on a daily basis. It occupies Georgian territory. It is in Moldova against that government's consent. It is killing Syrian civilians. It is threatening our forces and the forces we're supporting in Syria. It interferes in our elections. It tries to discredit our political systems. These aren't narrow challenges. They're not potential challenges. These are existential challenges that are occurring right here and have been going on for a number of years. And they will continue to go on unless and until we push back on this. I know the clock says zero, but can I just quickly pick up on a point Matt said? Actually, now it says one. Um, well, that's because, <laughs> miracle of that's time. because it's time for Matt's minute, but go ahead. Just very quickly on Matt's point about abstraction. I, I see people sitting in this room who aren't abstract. They can't go back to their country because if they do, they'll either be arrested or killed. Um, there are people in Russia who are struggling for a better future for their country. I want to stand with those people and with the people in Russia who are struggling. It's not abstract to say that we stand for people to choose their own leaders freely, to be able to associate with whatever organizations okay, they want to. Okay, but that's to not assemble. answering the question about a threat to the United States. And so that's, so that's I get what you're saying about... The way they treat their own people is indicative of how they're going to behave on foreign policy. If they don't respect their own citizens' human rights, then they're certainly not going to respect concepts of sovereignty and territorial integrity or the human rights of Syrians or you name it, or our electoral systems or our democratic systems. Instead, they exploit our openness, our willingness to take people in 
and then try to bring us down. And as I said, they're oh. challenging our interests across okay. the board. Matt? Yeah, so thank you uh, for bringing this in, David, because uh, I, I think it is important. And, and I want to be very clear on this, the term abstraction. Uh, what I'm talking about is what we cannot promote for Russians is a notion that they ought to have a democracy like ours because that's how they should live, right? You're right. It's the concrete people, the Russians themselves, who should be saying how they want to live. But here's the problem with Americans becoming the principal champions of human rights in Russia. Uh, number one, the morality of outcomes. When we do that, we don't necessarily get better human rights in Russia. And I would argue there we need to look to the historical record. It is more often the case than not that when we engage with Russia, we negotiate in ways that brings Russia into the international system, we actually get a more pliable Russia that is better both for Russians and Americans. Second, we need to be consistent about it. There are plenty of countries around the world that do actually far more horrible things to their people than what the Russians are doing. We do not define those countries as threat number one because of the terrible nature of the regime. We don't crusade against those countries. Maybe we ought to, but the inconsistency is problematic both for their citizens, for Russians, and for Americans. And lastly, we got to look to our own record, right? This is where we end up with vulnerabilities vis-a-vis -vis the Russian people, right? Because we are imperfect, it is unwise for us to appoint ourselves as the guardians of what ought to be Russia's democratic future. Again, the fact that Russians understand right. by and large what's going on in the world in the United States makes it harder for us to sort of sell this line. Can I just no, quickly? No, no. <laughs> um, just a quick, just a quick question. What do you say to those who argue that you're suggesting that the U.S. kind of coddle Russia to effect a different behavior as opposed to punishing Russia for the behavior that is threatening to the United States? Well, just I definitely, quickly. thank you, I, quickly, I, I wouldn't advocate coddling of any kind. What I would say is uh, when behavior, specific behavior, is threatening to vital American interests, and we got to be crystal clear about what those are, we got to understand what they are first, then Russia's got to understand what they are. If either side of that equation doesn't understand what they are, it doesn't Attacking work. Attacking our elections and, is included okay. in that. Great. Then we, then we need to deter them. And deterrence doesn't work after the fact, right? So deterrence is not containment is what you're saying? No, I think deterrence is part of a strategy that can include engagement, it can include knowing right. something about how Russian politics works, and it can include realism yeah. about what is likely the outcome of our policies. Okay, I want to move on to a question. No, 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 no. Sorry. <laughs> we, I think we... It's a democracy. I, there, you said this was a democracy. All right. Moving on. Um, Moving I, I, I want to get to an important question that we did discuss in the room before we came out here about whether Russia has justifiable concerns. Have we misstepped um, in dealing with Russia? And do they have a point on encirclement and their interests being trampled? You know, the Kremlin is convinced, as um, Matt said, that the U.S. is laying a groundwork for regime change. We're responsible for NATO expansion. You know, we support Ukraine. We support missile defense. They believe that the U.S. was responsible for the color, color revolutions and the Arab Spring is just another manifestation of that. So why don't you guys um, take two minutes on that? We, we have brought Russia into the WTO, G8, Council of Europe, um, countless organizations and entities, and look at where we are. They try to undermine the, the integrity of these organizations. We, we've kicked them out of the G8. Um, and so engaging with them, bringing them in, has not worked. The Russian NATO Council has been feckless. So it, it isn't for lack of trying to bring Russia into the international community, the Euro-Atlantic community. Um, it is a paranoia on the part of a leadership that thinks that there are enemies from outside. It goes back, and Tom, in your article, you talked about Beslan. Um, I did in the book, and Munich, of course. Um, this is a leader who needs to perpetuate a myth that the West is a threat to Russia. If, it, it just isn't true. If I could just add to that, there is a misunderstanding, and it does go beyond Putin and the Kremlin. I mean, certainly there is a history in Russia of feeling encircled by the West. There is an understandable, you know, apprehension that they would have towards NATO enlargement. However, the answer to that is not to go and invade your neighbors and occupy them, you know, Georgia and then Ukraine. It's not to break in the international order apart, you know, to, to challenge it in a full frontal fashion. So, you know, while you can argue that they may have legitimate concerns that should be addressed, they're not going about getting their concerns addressed 
in a in a legitimate fashion. And we got thirty seconds. The the uh, issue is <laughs> there, there have been there have been issues between us in which we don't agree. We just have to recognize that Russia and the United States are not always going to agree, whether it's on Kosovo or missile defense or NATO enlargement. But if we grant Russia de facto veto over other countries' aspirations to join organizations like NATO or the EU. By the way, Ukraine was going to sign an agreement with the EU in 2013, not join NATO, and that suddenly became the hot-button issue for Putin. Um, we, we can't grant Russia a de facto veto over other countries' aspirations. That would be completely undermining the international system. No more Yalta. System. Right. Well, I mean, that's exact. I mean, I think one thing you and Tom are agreeing on is that U.S. and Russia are not going to agree. On, on everything, right? Absolutely. We won't. Okay. Let me just Reality. make one point here. I, I think it's very important. Let's put a minute on the clock. <laughs> Give him 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Well, one point, one well, minute. You can have a minute and maybe a little oh, change okay. for you guys. The point that I think we need to make here is that what you've talked about are clearly Russian perceptions about what American policy has been, uh, uh, that it's uh, impinging on Russia's sphere of influence, uh, that the ultimate goal is regime change. Those are perceptions. Uh, I think the Russians themselves can find data points that will support those. Uh, I agree that uh, the United States, in its policy, has attempted to pursue a different type of, uh, of uh, a goal of bringing Russia into the system. What we haven't done, though, is taken those concerns sufficiently into account as we, f as we formulate our own policy. Uh, what Russia did in Crimea should not have been a surprise to us, but we were caught flat-footed. What they did in eastern Ukraine should not have been a surprise to us, but we were caught flat-footed. What we need to do is understand what those things, what the Russian positions are, what their perceptions are, uh, and be prepared with responses so that the situation does not turn out to be worse than it would have been otherwise. Uh, and so formulating a policy that takes into account Russian perceptions uh, factors those into the way we act with a goal of, over time, achieving the interest uh, that we would like to vis-a-vis -vis Russia. But just very quickly, no, 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 just very quick, <laughs> just very quickly to Evelyn's point that I think you both agree that they have legitimate concerns, but that Russia is not going about it that right, and that doesn't inspire American confidence to try differently. Matt. Yeah, if, if I could. So, Here's the, so I, I actually was trained as a public international lawyer, and the problem with public <laughs> international law is that it's mostly not a story of the rules as countries say they should be. It's mostly a story of the rules as they exist when countries behave according to those rules. And I agree that Russia's violated rules that it said exist, that it joined with us and sort of signed at the bottom and said, these are the rules. Uh, the problem is there is not, in fact, an international judge, jury, and execution that says, and now you shall obey those rules. The only way to go about getting the rules back, getting the system back, whether well, it's arms control, Council. European security, human rights, whatever it is, is to sit down and hash it out and negotiate with the other folks who have power in that system. Whether we like it or not, the Russians have power in the system. So can I ask both Tom and Matt, it what are we supposed to sit down and talk to the Russian, the, the Putin regime about after it's invaded Ukraine? And actually, if I can, if I can is, interject what, before wait, wait, that, we actually sat down. We brokered people. something. You know, we had our diplomats from the State Department. I was in the administration at the time in 2014. We brokered an agreement. There was a Russian witness there. And then all of a sudden, Yanukovych fled to, to Russia, and you had the invasion by the Russians and then the separatist movement in Donbass. Well, so it didn't exactly go like just like that. <laughs> yes, he fled, but then like, you know, there were State Department officials on the ground in Maidan Square giving bagels to the protesters. I mean, the U.S. did no. kind of push the no. line of it Ukraine's support. To the demonstrators, <laughs> All right. and then while they were broke, while we brokered an agreement which would have allowed Yanukovych to stay in the country. And brokered we a We were transition. pushing them to join. We, uh, the U.S. was pushing event, them to join the EU. The point now is that if you want to bring the conflict in eastern Ukraine to an end, that you have to deal with a country that has some influence over, over that situation. That's Russia. You don't have to like what Russia is doing, right. but it's a power, and you have to deal with that power, and you have to get the best deal that you can under the circumstances. So... Uh, again, it's not a question of liking what Russia's done. 
Okay. It's a matter of looking at the real situation uh, and deciding what's the best possible outcome you can get at this moment <laughs> and what keeps open your option for getting a better uh, outcome over the long term. I mean, too much of this is focused on trying to resolve things here and now. We need to think in longer terms. We need to solve parts of problems that we can now, keep open the possibility of getting more over the longer term uh, through an, a more effective uh, policy and some uh, uh, hope that conditions will change inside Russia as well that will lead to a better outcome. Lee, let me just say, th there's an enormous difference between standing in Maidan Square, offering support to Ukrainian protesters, handing out cookies, tea, whatever the case may be, and sending in guns oh, and weapons absolutely. and forces and tanks and absolutely. invading Ukraine. Um, so what we but did I mean, was I mean, to stand true to, to our values. the question of whether Russia kind of justifiably felt felt encircled. That's, that was my only... Uh, Yanukovych was going to sign an agreement with the European Union. Previously, Putin didn't view the EU as a threat. Suddenly, he wakes up in 2013, decides <laughs> to pressure Armenia not to sign the DCFTA and association agreement with the EU. He tries the same with Moldova. I don't know that he tried all that, that much with Georgia, line. and he did it with Ukraine. Exactly. All right, Matt, you have a quick point, and then I want to yeah, ask one more very, question very quickly, before we open it up. I, I am tr very troubled, uh, as someone who's been uh, engaged with Ukraine for a very long time, about this notion that sort of it's binary, right? You support Ukraine, and that means that you are just sort of the absolute to the nth degree uh, sort of opponent of the Putin regime as it is in all of its evil. The reality is uh, we could have been and can still be very supportive of Ukraine, including up to and including pushing in every way we can to get it, its territorial sovereignty and integri territorial integrity back uh, in ways that are not perceived by the Russians to be the path towards either geopolitical encirclement or regime change. And the problem is one of perceptions. The, the notion that we're even talking about cookies on the Maidan that's an absurdity, and it's about the problem of perceptions in this relationship. What matters is the conversations that our mutual colleague, Ambassador Volker, may be having now over in Europe with, I hope, with Russians as well as with Ukrainians, not who's handing out cookies on the Maidan, who's sponsoring who's broadcast. It's that negotiation that matters, and that's what we're advocating. That's engagement. Well, that's it engagement. wasn't just cookies. There were, there were real negotiations going on that... Our right. assistant well, secretary at the, the time. Yes. Drop the cookies. The point was that <laughs> it has the, crumbled. The point, the cookie, cr that's the way the cookie crumbles. The point was th their perceptions of um, of what the U.S. was doing. Let me ask. I want. Well, let's go to one last question from me, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, is are we talking about a Russia problem, or are we talking about a Putin problem? Now, you have elections, as we were saying, coming up in March 2018. So would a new Russian leader, if, you know, you know <laughs> in some scenario, were to win, which doesn't look very likely, um, is, are we talking about a Russian leader or the Russian leader? That's, that's the problem here. You want to start? Take that first. Is, is that, that my, that's the question yeah. for me? Yeah. Uh, you say we have a Russia problem. Not just. Do we have a Russia problem, or I think I think we face a Russia challenge. I mean, this is a country historically uh, that has uh, advocated a set of values that are quite different from ours, uh, and uh, quite different from the values of Western Europe. But it's a country uh, that has had a powerful influence on security uh, within uh, Europe historically for at least the past two to, uh, to three hundred years. The Russia problem we've. Uh, we have is how do you deal with a country, manage relations with a country that is alien in, in many ways, doesn't share your values, yet is critical to se your security. Uh, that continues to be the, the challenge that we face with Russia today, and that's going to be the challenge whether it's Putin or Navalny or someone else uh, that's president uh, of Russia. Uh, that's, uh, uh, I think, the, the critical thing at, at this point to bear in mind. Uh, I think it's also true that Russians, that Putin fits within a long tradition of Russian strategic thinking. Russia has to be a great power. Uh, that has been a mantra uh, for Russia, again, for two to three hundred years. Russia has to have a sphere of influence. They believe in that. Uh, even Navalny uh, is not going to give back uh, Crimea to Ukraine at this point. Uh, that is going to shape the thinking of any Russian leader. So we're going to have those problems no matter who it is. Now, the actual tactics might differ. 
Uh, we might find someone more agreeable. Uh, Gorbachev was an easier person to deal with than Putin was. Uh, but it isn't going to change the fundamental nature uh, of the puzzle that we face in managing a, a relationship with a powerful country uh, that doesn't share our values. So I would just counter, um, if I could, that what does make this president different, I think, from other presidents, and, 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 it, and it's really the president rather than just the people around him in the Kremlin, is that Putin is a risk taker. The fact that he <laughs> attacked our elections with an information operation frankly surprised me. It happened after I left government. We were, I mean, after, we were surprised by Crimea too. He is consistently willing to take high stake risk and, and execute policy, absorb the risk. So I think that makes Putin different. Matt, what do you think? Yeah. I agree. He's willing to take risks. Sorry, I was thinking about policy recommendations. But, but it's a calculated risk. I mean, he, the Crimea uh, operation, it was a risk. How did it turn out in the short term for him? Quite well. Did we respond uh, with, the, with a few and sanctions? Donbass, not so well. Uh, quite differently. But, I, I mean, it's, um, uh, it, it's still, I, would, I think he would argue that uh, it hasn't been a debacle for him up to this point, that he still has a lever for influencing an outcome in, uh, in Ukraine. In our elections, if I'm sitting in Moscow and looking at what's happening here, what risk did I take? I mean, the United States political system well, we're is destroying asking itself. Whether at the end of the this film. is a problem of Putin or of, or of Russia, though, Matt. Look, Matt. In, in the short term, I do think we have problems with Putin. What we are building for the long term that troubles me now is a Russia problem, is a Russia problem that will trouble us for a very, very long time. And when and if Putin goes away, which I believe he will, right? I mean, simple biology, right? He's already <laughs> exceeded the maximum, the average lifespan for a Russian male, though he lives healthfully uh, in some respects. If you look uh, at you know, we're going we're gonna to be dealing with a post-Putin Russia sooner or later. That's a Russia I want to know how to engage effectively. And the fact that we're engaged in a sort of national forgetting process on how to do diplomacy and how to properly do deterrence means we're not going to engage effectively with a post-Putin Russia either. David. We, we have a Putin regime problem. Um, I, I don't accept that we have a Russia problem. Uh, in fact, I think to many Russians, Tom, that would be viewed as offensive. Um, it, it suggests that Russians are inherently incapable of moving in a more democratic direction. I think if given the choice, they absolutely would. It wouldn't be like us. It would be in their own form. As but it isn't be. it equally as, um, I mean, he's very popular. And he, as you know, I mean, when a stranger calls you up and asks you, do you, do you support uh, Vladimir Putin? And you don't know who that stranger is. What are you going to say? No, I hate the guy. I mean, it's an authoritarian regime that deals with its enemies in a nasty, brutal way. And so I, I imagine his popularity is high. I think it's very shallow. Um, and, and, you know, is the, the, if we learn nothing else from what happened in 2011 in the Arab world, these regimes seem stable until they're not. We don't know what the tipping point is in Russia. So the problem is not just the individual Vladimir Putin, although he obviously is a big problem. He has been the one consistent factor going from Clinton to Bush to Obama now to Trump, where we have run into problems with, with the leadership in That's Moscow. That's true. I mean, we had an easier time with Medvedev. And, and, and you mentioned Gorbachev, Tom, and, and Yeltsin was easier to deal with, certainly not a piece of cake. But, but the point is, it's the regime because the regime is so corrupt. The more corrupt it becomes, the more authoritarian it has to become, and the more desperate it is to stay in power because it can't afford to give up power. Right, if you, it surrenders wait, power, wait, it's a point on the risk of being arrested. If you look at Yeltsin, I mean, Putin is always presented as the antithesis to Yeltsin. Yeltsin was opposed to NATO expansion. Yeltsin was opposed to our policy in the Balkans. Yeltsin uh, tried to build a troika of, with, with Germany and France to undermine our influence in Europe. It's the Yeltsin uh, administration that thought of the, the, the Russia, China, India as a counter to U.S. global influence. The difference between Yeltsin and, and Putin is not one of ambition. It's one of capabilities. Russia grew stronger and it was able to act on its ambitions. Uh, and so, again, I think we have a, a, a long tradition here, a trajectory, uh, and we've got to deal with these things. Uh, and, and as Matt has said, we need to engage uh, in part because we need to engage for our own, our, our own security reasons. Uh, it's not a matter of we like Putin or not. 
it's a reality that's there. That Tom, we you left. Let's open it up. Let's open it up. Real quick. That's Tom, you left out. I, I really Yel want to Yeltsin, open it up to the Yeltsin audience. also gave us Putin. Let's not let Yeltsin off the hook. He is the one <laughs> on, who chose Putin <laughs> and made him prime minister. He didn't and then break international down. law left, right, right. center. Right. Matt. Yeah, I just haven't and gotten to say anything about the Putin one regime. One tweet. Thing. Look, worthy. Just, I ask myself. I ask myself one question when I hear David's analysis about the potential <laughs> frailty of the Putin system. I think it may be exactly right. But I ask myself this question, are we better off or worse off if the United States is seen to have a vital interest, uh, an engagement, a hand, maybe a shove over the cliff, an involvement of any kind in bringing about that outcome? And my answer is crystal clear, which is I'd far rather that it be the Russian people authoring this from beginning to end. Well, you didn't hear either of us say we should provide support to I, Navalny or someone like that. And why is this central to American national interest? Because of the violation of international law and our, and our national security interests. All right, let's open it up to the audience. If you have a question, um, it's a little bit dark back there, so raise your hand, like, pretty high, and um, microphone will come to you. We're going to go to this gentleman right here, and then we're going to go right here, okay? Hi there. Um, you said earlier that Russia was only dealing with threats and it's an immediate periphery. What do you? What's your response to Putin cozying up to do twerking? Yeah, can I? I'm sorry. Um, sorry, can, can you, hear you me? please um, identify yourself? And if you have the question for a specific person, um, ask it to that specific person. But most importantly, please identify yourself. All right. Matt Covert, Congressman Devin Nunes' office. Um, this is for Matthew Rajansky. Um If you could just address uh, Putin getting uh, cl closer to do twerte as the U.S. moves away and. Uh, Oh, that was in relation to your earlier comment about how it's only concerned with its immediate periphery. All right. Want me to just answer? Yeah, just answer it. We have about. I don't, I don't think I said Russia's only concerned minutes, with so. its immediate periphery. I think what what uh, Putin is engaging in right now. I don't know what's in his head. I only can judge based on what he says and what he does. I think what he's engaging in right now is because he believes that he is in a survival struggle with the United States because he hears American policy is being expressed as. Putin is the enemy. The Putin regime is the enemy. What the Putin regime does in what it believes is advancing Russian national interests, wherever those may be, is contrary to American national interests. Therefore, where he can strike asymmetrically, where he has advantages because we're not paying attention in certain parts of the world, where maybe he has certain technical advantages or he's willing to do things that we're not willing to do, that's where he strikes. I don't think that he defines a sphere of interest in particular areas or other areas other than the obvious, right, which is the post-Soviet space. But I absolutely don't think that's exclusive. Okay. Hello, Mr. Kramer. Uh, my question is for you about your statement that uh, the U.S. needs to work with its allies to be able to contain Russia. Now, how exactly is the U.S. supposed Could to do that? Can you identify yourself? Oh, sorry, no award, American University. Uh, you state that you know we're supposed to work with them to contain Russia, but how exactly are we supposed to be able to do that whenever countries such as Spain and Italy find themselves more and more drawn towards relaxing these sanctions to improve their overall economic situation? Um, it's not easy. But if the United States doesn't lead, then it won't happen. Um, the, the U.S., I would say, did lead on the sanctions with Chancellor Merkel in particular um, in response to Ukraine. But there, the, the, the difference is we have one government, and it's a huge government, and it's hard enough to get agreement within the U.S. federal government. But the EU has, what, 28 member states? And so getting agreement among them is much more challenging to do. That's why I think the United States needs to lead. Everyone wants unity between the U.S. and Europe on dealing with Russia. But sometimes it just can't happen because of the realities that you pointed to, that certain European countries have vested interests with Russia that they want and need to protect. You look at Nord Stream 2. Uh, Nord Stream 2 is a terrible idea. And the United States, I, I regret that the sanctions legislation was watered down to address European concerns about it. Chancellor Merkel, I hope, after the election, realizes that Nord Stream 2 is a terrible idea, and I hope she kills it. It's bad for Ukraine, it's bad for Poland, it's bad for the Baltic states. It's ultimately, at the end of the day, it's bad for Russia. So I, 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 I want to stress, it's not easy to get unity, and where we have to, the U.S. should take the lead because it is easier, though not easy, for us to do so. Okay, we're going to go um, in the back right here, and then we're going to go... Um, we're going to take these three questions, and then I think that'll be all we have time for. Hi. Um, Alana Nick Fajin. Um, in the last election, um, I think we're all looking forward, we're, we're looking towards the next one in terms of to see if there's any cracks. 
But in the last one, Moscow and Kaliningrad were the lowest ranking positions that he came in in, with obviously Chechnya at the highest. Do you think in the next one we might be able to see more areas where the support might be more shallow and see if that's an area we can exploit and put more pressure on? Do you guys want to want that one? We're going to take it. We're going to answer these questions individually, all three at once. I mean, no, we'll we'll I'll take the last three as a kind of a lightning round. Let's let's just go to this one right now. I give you a simple answer to that. Uh, analytically, I think that that's correct. As a matter of policy, I think it should have almost no bearing on U.S. policy where there's a weakness to be exploited in Vladimir Putin's re-election. I think that is an incredibly dangerous policy prescription for reasons I, I hope I laid out with some clarity tonight. Okay, ma'am. The Russians would consider it interference in their internal affairs. I would think so, and, and I would think they, <laughs> they might um, be tempted to do exactly the same to us as they are doing. I don't think our strategy involves meddling in, in the internal dynamics, political dynamics. The question is, it was, should it? Should it? And I'm saying no. No. And I'm glad you oh, agree. No. You don't think that the U.S. should support um, a kind of anti a, a candidate that could replace Putin? No, I don't think it would help that candidate. Right. And I think we need to defend our national interest and that of our allies and partners, which includes defending the international order. But that does not extend to meddling in Russia's domestic elections. And we, but we should, Politics. as we do everywhere around the world, perhaps and consistently, I'll acknowledge, support the notion and principle of free and fair elections, where there's a level playing field, where... Uh, fraudulent, phony charges against Navalny are not brought up in order to disqualify him from running. And, and how, do you, how do you do that without interfering in well, the domestic affairs? Or? I think to bridge that, um, if, we're go if, if Vladimir Putin is going to run around saying he was elected in a free and fair election, then I think the international community has certainly the right to give their opinion about whether they thought it was free or fair. And the U.S. probably wouldn't be alone. Look, on you know, in response to the December 2011 rigged uh, Duma elections, Russians on their own turned out in the streets, despite what Putin thinks that Secretary of uh, State Clinton gave a signal for them to turn out. Russians turned out, just like Ukrainians turned out in 2004. Putin refuses to accept that Russians or Ukrainians or whoever you name are indigenously capable on their own of protesting against lousy elections or against corruption. He thinks it all has to be spawned and fomented from Washington. If only we were that good. I wish we were. <laughs> okay, we're going to take these two. We're going to take these two questions right here, uh, ma'am, and then right the gentleman right behind you. Paolo Akop, I'm a Syrian attorney. My question is for Matt and Thomas. Um, what do you think about um, the fact that maybe the Russian involvement in the Syrian conflict, um, uh, committing all, helping the Syrian regime and committing all these crimes against humanity and war crimes may be a main factor that pushed to radicalize more people in Syria? And if so, uh, how would this affect the national security of the U.S.? Okay. Why don't you just hand that to the gentleman behind you, but let's take this question. Thank you. Andrei Piankovsky, Hudson Institute uh, Visiting Fellow. My question to my old friend, uh, Tom Graham. Uh, Tom, I was puzzled uh, by your uh, initial point on Ukraine. Uh, Putin in, in Crimea, Putin in Donbass, uh, two years has passed, containment fail, so we should go to, uh, go to engagement. First, you are wrong. Containment did not fail. Putin's plan was Novorossia. Then, 12 uh, regions uh, of uh, Ukraine. It failed with your resistance of Ukrainian people and also by modest containment of Europe and the United States. Uh, how are you going to engage uh, this aggressor behind uh, the back of victim uh, of aggression? You personally gave example of such engagement uh, in Finland uh, uh, in uh, 2017 together with uh, General Trubnikov, okay. KGB General Trubnikov. But it's this kind of engagement Let's was rejected correctly by Ukrainians. Let's give him a chance to answer, okay? Well, why don't you take this question first and then we'll move to Syria. Uh, uh, that, that's a very good question. Uh, go back and read the, the Boisto document. Uh, it looks a lot like the Minsk Agreement, uh, which we all say uh, is instrumental to, to resolving the crisis in U Ukraine at this point. Um, so I don't have any problems with that. Engagement with Russia doesn't mean 
going around the backs of everybody. We, engage, we should be engaging with everybody. We should be engaging with the Ukrainians and the Europeans. A solution to the, uh, to the various issues uh, in, in Ukraine at this point comes from an agreement with the Russians, with the Ukrainians, with the Europeans, and with the United States. Uh, and we have to be actively engaged with Russia and to try to find the, the parameters for that, uh, for that solution. That's one of the reasons we have Kurt Volker uh, appointed for this spe specific purpose, talking with Surkov on the Russian side. So I wish him uh, well, and I think it's the appropriate uh, way to proceed, engaging Russia, Sorry. thinking out uh, clearly what the, what the parameters of a solution can be. Okay, Matt, why don't you take the Syria yes, question? Yes, no problem. So, uh, Assad committing atrocities uh, in Syria with Russian support, radicalizing people. I think it's two tragedies. Tragedy one is what they're doing. Tragedy two will come, and maybe is already coming, and that's the superhighway of radicalized people that will, both in idea and in reality, flow into Russia and attack and kill Russians. They're both tragedies. What do we do about it? Why is it in the American national interest? I think problem number one is for four years we had a Syrian war, we had Assad committing atrocities and we didn't do very much about it and then Russia came in. Russia wasn't in in a significant way before that, right? So we missed opportunity one in terms of policy. What do we do about it now? I think un unless or until we're actually prepared to stop what is a military operation by military means, there's not a lot we can do to stop Russia in Syria. However, I think there is, and this is what engagement and diplomacy is about, there is a conversation to be had about the nature of a radicalization threat that I do think threatens both societies, where we can try to condition our support for what Russia wants to see happen in the global fight against radicalized terror on their not doing things that make the problem worse. Okay. Uh, one last question by this uh, woman in the back. And, and just pass the microphone to your... To, to, and then just pass the microphone forward. I'm going to have to ask you to keep your questions super quick so we can get to both of them, and then we're going to um, have our closing arguments. So it'll be um, this woman right here, and then this gentleman right here, and then I'm going to have to close the floor. I'm sorry. Okay, so my name is Julia Latarulo. I'm with the Red Executive Development, and my question is that this whole debate has been on the Russia time to contain, but kind of should we focus on undermining Russia? Because right now, Russia has spread to Latin America, Europe, and Asia. Should we focus there and kind of start in the outside and work our way in? Or should we focus primarily on Russia? Because I feel like bolstering Russia gives them e an ego to work and that we kind of give them power because we focus so much on Russia. Great question. Thank you. And then uh, just keep it quick, okay? Rudolf Rojas, uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, directed towards Mr. Kramer. Uh, do you believe that uh, the United States should actualize on the Congress's uh, desire to provide um, uh, stronger military uh, materiel to Ukraine to uh, push back on Russia okay. before the election? Thank you. Okay. Evelyn, why don't you take the uh, uh, first question about Latin America and Kind of can darn because I because I because I feel really strongly about right, this. Right. Well, why don't one. you take why don't you take um, that one? And but I mean, no, I will I will say I mean, as far as you know, Russia on the periphery. Look, Russia is trying to undermine democracy across the board. They clearly have right now. The Kremlin believes that Putin's. Putin's future is guaranteed in as much as he can demonstrate to the Russian people that Russia's great again. So some of these things that he's doing in other parts of the world, they're not even very big in terms of the, the price and the effort, but he's demonstrating to the Russian people that Russia is a global power and the world, but to the Russian people first and foremost, Russia's a global power. I'm making Russia great again. Economically, things are not as good for you Russian people today as they were a couple of years ago when oil prices were high. But that's okay because I'm making Russia great again. I'm making Russia a global power again. So I do think that we need to pay attention to what Putin's doing, but we shouldn't overreact. I do think you're right that some of the things he does around the periphery, he does to throw us off our game, to divert attention. You know, it's like a Twitter tweet. <laughs> so, uh, Twitter tweet, tweet? Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> That's for the kids. I don't, I don't, I don't tweet. Redundant. Um, and then on uh, Ukraine. I'm super quick on that. because I, I guess I'll let David, because it was direct, direct well, to you. I, but I I'll, I think... I'll wait till the conclusion yes or no. for my... 
Yes. Okay. hundred percent. I mean, I wrote a piece in the Washington Post March 2nd, 2014, arguing for U.S. support for Ukraine, including sending battleships to the Black Sea and providing assistance. And that's been my position. I know Evelyn was in the government at the time, but I think it's fair to say that was your position inside. Um, I think it was an enormous mistake on President Obama's part um, because he he overthought the possibility of Russian escalation, had to think about it. You had to be prepared for that possibility. But Ukrainians were not asking for American soldiers to go fight their fight for them. They were asking for the means to be able to defend their own country against Russian aggression. And as Kurt has said, if you don't have tanks going in from Russia into Ukraine, then you don't have much to worry about with anti-tank weapons, with javelins. And uh, I would argue Georgia and Moldova should have the same absolutely. opportunity. Absolutely. We, we, we need to bolster Russia's neighbors and make them successful democratic countries that can join NATO or the EU if they choose to, or don't join NATO in the EU if they choose to. Otherwise, we are granting Russia a de facto veto over these countries' future, and that's something we should never accept. Very quickly on Syria, um, I, I, I take Matt's point. I mean, look, the biggest problem on Syria um, was President Obama's refusal to do anything. Um, he opened the door for Putin to step in. He filled a void that Obama left. I think this will be the biggest stain on Obama's legacy. And for him to have told Jeffrey Goldberg in The Atlantic that this was the thing he was most proud of, resisting the pressure, do something on Syria, I think he should be ashamed. Okay. Um, we're going to have our closing arguments. Um, we're going to have one minute for each panelist to uh, make a closing argument looking forward to policy recommendations um, for the administration. And uh, since David and Evelyn started, Matt, why don't you start? Okay. Uh, thanks, because I was sort of scribbling these out. Uh, look, number one, uh, go back, you know, we're talking containment, go back to Kennan, the long telegram, 1946. Out of five recommendations he concludes with, two of them are knowing about Russia. And he used the term Russia, not the Soviet Union. Because when asked, he said, I don't think the Soviet Union will be around forever, but I know that Russia will. So we need to study Russia. We need to actually know something about this place. It's inexcusable that we have more or less abandoned serious Russia expertise in this country and in our government for something like a decade and a half or two decades. Number two, I think we need to define our interests with real clarity for ourselves, but also so that the Russians understand them. And then we need to communicate clearly the consequences and the deterrent methods that we're going to apply in case Russia does things that really threatens us or even thinks about doing them. And third, and let me end on this, and it's Kennan again, the most effective plank that we will ever have for containing Russia, for deterring Russia, but also for promoting American interests directly is leadership by example. Get our house in order. And Kennan wrote these words, and I'll end on these, 1946. It is about the degree to which the United States can create among the peoples of the world generally the impression of a country which knows what it wants, which is coping successfully with the problems of its internal life and with the responsibilities of a world power, and which has a spiritual vitality capable of holding its own among the major ideological currents of the time. If we have that today, I submit that we will prevail in this conflict. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, Tom, why don't you... I agree why don't with that. Why don't we mix it up? Evelyn, you go. Okay, so, I, 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 look, what, what we need to do here right now is defend the international order. We need to defend the Westphalian state system, that is to say, sovereignty for the existing states. And in the case of the U.S. and West, the West, our Western allies, to include Japan and others, it means defending our democracy and our free market economy. And when it comes down to it, we do that while we strengthen our democracy and protect ourselves from the incursion of the Russians and others who would want to weaken our democracy. So to the extent that we are weak today, in large part, I'm not saying it's entirely Russia's fault, but in large part it's due to intrusions by Russia and Russia's exacerbation of existing problems in our country. So we, will, we would do a better job strengthening our democracy and the international order if we could push back against Russia and its intrusions in our democracy. Thanks, Evelyn. Um, <laughs> we'll, clap, we'll clap at the end. Um, Tom, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, I agree with everything George Kennan said. <laughs> uh, but I would make this following point. I mean, I do think we need to defend our democracy. 
Uh, but we need to do those things that we know we need to do to defend democracy. The greatest threat to democracy today exists inside the United States. Uh, and we're using Russian interference, and it's a serious issue, to deflect attention from the things that we need to do. We need to get our cybersecurity in order. We know that. It's not only to defend ourselves against Russian intrusions, defend ourselves against other countries, China, uh, Iran, North Korea, that, are, that wish us ill. Uh, we can do this. It's difficult to do, and it's much easier to talk about Russian interference than it is to take the hard steps we need here to do our cybersecurity. Fake news. The Russians didn't invent fake news. Fake news is all over the Internet today. Uh, we need to train our population to understand how to analyze the material that crosses their screens every day. Uh, if we educate our population, if we defend our uh, security sy systems, we will strengthen our uh, democracy, uh, and it will be a system in which Russia, if it tries to intrude, will fail. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And David, you provided the books today, so you're getting the last word. Thanks. <laughs> Um, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight and uh, those who have been following it live stream. And thanks, Elise, and thanks, Matt and Tom, and particularly Evelyn, uh, for joining me here tonight. Last year, when Tom and I debated, I asked a rhetorical question. I'm going to update it uh, here this evening. How many more Russian liberal activists need to be killed or poisoned? How many more countries does Putin need to invade? How many more Ukrainians need to die? How many more civilians need to be killed in Syria? And how many more elections does Putin need to interfere in before we understand the existential threat the Putin regime represents? We need a tougher approach in dealing with Putin's Russia, a kind of containment approach that includes ramping up sanctions, not weakening them, bolstering Russia's neighbors and making them successful, standing up to Russia's human rights abuses, investigating Russian corruption and cleaning up our own act while protecting our own systems from Russian interference. Thank you. Thank you, David. I just want to say before we close that the four people sitting here are some of the best people that we have working on Russia. And I'm sure, as you can see, with the variety of opinions and analysis, that this is not an easy issue. And all of that facets of the relationship with Russia are so complex. And I encourage you to um, follow their writings. David's book um, is, is – there's copies outside. I encourage you to um, take one and read it. Um, you can follow most of them on Twitter. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but um, I just want to thank them again for this really enlightening panel and, and their thoughts. And thank you for coming and yep. everybody watching online. And thanks to the McCain Institute. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this evening's debate. Please, now you can, you can go ahead and leave. I just want to say a big applause for Elise Labatt for a wonderful moderation.